TTIP aims at intensifying regulatory cooperation between the US and EU in many different areas, which are also pertinent for public policy such as food safety, environmental standards, public health and others. Where do you see policy areas which are particularly sensitive from a social and environmental point of view? Well, there are certainly many, many possibilities. I think uh, food safety and agriculture has been a hot topic with many different standards on the two sides. Chemicals policy is another area with chemical industry trying to roll back some parts of reach as part of this. Um, the labor standards could be an issue. Uh, it's not certain yet how much that will come in. Th there are many possibilities. Climate policy might also be another one. Proponents of TTIP claim that the standards will not be lowered in Europe and not be lowered in the US. How would you assess that? What, what fear would you see according standards getting lower? It's very nice to say that, but I'm not sure that's part of the whole discussion. The ISDS, now renamed, but the uh, investor rights which are built into the system that allow investors to sue governments could quickly lead to uh, reductions in standards. The economic models showing the benefits of TTIP are based entirely on assuming that changes in non-tariff barriers, mostly meaning regulations, will be lowered. So th the modelers who project gains have projected it by lowering standards. You have done a lot of research on costs, benefits, cross-costs analysis, cross-benefit analysis. What is the main trouble with doing that? When you analyze the costs and benefits of a public policy, the costs are often hard numbers, real investments that you have to make. You know, you purchase hardware, you install it, you, you pay for equipment. So we have well-defined numbers for the costs. The benefits are saving lives, avoiding illnesses, protecting nature, protecting other species protecting social values, these things do not have natural prices. And so economists end up making up prices, and I use the words intentionally, they make up numbers to describe what you might imagine the price to be. If all you have is a calculator, everything has to look like a number, whether or not it's actually numerical. What should a model, a new model, an alternative model, according trade, according economics, according free trade especially, what should a new model take into account? Well, a model has to simplify reality. The, it's guaranteed to get rid of some details. The whole question and the, the art rather than the science is did you identify the details that matter to keep in the model and shed the details that don't matter? Uh, I think one of the very important points that's come out here is this assumption of full employment. The standard models that project benefits from TTIP are all what's called computable general equilibrium, CGE models. They all make a number of very strange assumptions such as full employment is guaranteed both before and after a new policy that you're analyzing. So if you project that your CGE model shows that there's no loss of jobs, that's not an output of the model, that's an input. You put it in. So it, it doesn't really count as something that you discovered. I think that the most interesting point that to come up about modeling is that there are alternatives that allow study of the variation in employment. Will it go up or down? Some of them say that Europe as a whole will lose jobs. Some of them say that low-skilled workers in the US and in Europe will lose jobs. These are findings that are worth thinking about that show that as soon as we admit that there are changes in employment possible, there are danger signs here. If you look on the protests that might already happen in the US, there are some in Europe, I know. How do you observe that? What is going on like protesting against TTIP in the US? In the US you have a wide division of political opinion. So you have the progressive end of the spectrum, you have unions, environmental groups, many NGOs which are protesting. You now have both of the Democratic Party candidates for president, uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, are now uh, opposing this kind of trade negotiation. In the, 
Other elements of the Democratic Party, I think, are still more committed to the corporate free trade agenda. The Republican Party is divided right down the middle with the more establishment figures strongly in favor of free trade and the, uh, the more unsavory populist and far-right elements uh, ranting about uh, keeping America strong and taking jobs back from China or Mexico. They are also opposed to free trade, although I think on a, a very different and less attractive basis.